There's no doubt that Raptor 3 is one of the most highly anticipated upgrades among those following SpaceX's Starship program. Not only is it the latest iteration of an already cutting-edge engine, but it also addresses several issues that have challenged Starship's performance so far. However, even with all its improvements, Raptor 3 isn't perfect, and Elon Musk has openly acknowledged that. So what's the issue? And more importantly, how might SpaceX solve it? In a recent post on X, Musk revealed a key challenge with the engine. Very complex startup sequence. Insane timing precision is needed to avoid blowing up the engine. That's right. The startup process for Raptor 3 is incredibly demanding. But why would an engine this advanced have trouble just getting started? To truly understand what Elon is talking about, let me first remind you how a Raptor engine works. Raptor is powered by subcooled liquid methane and subcooled liquid oxygen and operates using a full flow staged combustion cycle. This advanced cycle features both oxidizer rich and fuel rich pre burners, allowing all of the propellants to be fully used to drive the turbo pumps without venting any unburnt fuel or oxidizer overboard. This system is a significant departure from traditional open cycle gas generator engines like the Merlin, which uses LOX and kerosene. Prior to Raptor, no full flow stage combustion engine had ever flown, and only two had advanced far enough to reach testing. Despite its complexity, this cycle offers major advantages. It enables the use of the entire propellant flow to power the turbo machinery, allowing the engine to reach extremely high chamber pressures. Higher chamber pressure translates to greater efficiency, measured by specific impulse. It also enables a more compact engine design with reduced plumbing and a smaller nozzle throat. Another key benefit is thermal management. Because both preburners contribute energy to the turbo pumps and are integrated into the full flow, the exhaust gases driving the pumps are cooler than in other closed cycle engines, where only one propellant is preburned. This cooler, balanced flow helps reduce thermal stress and significantly extends engine life. To start a Raptor engine, the process begins with engine chill, a crucial phase where cryogenic propellants, liquid methane and liquid oxygen, are used to cool engine components. This step prevents thermal shock, which could otherwise damage the engine when extremely cold fuels make contact with warmer metal parts. Once chilled, the spin-up phase starts. Raptor 3 uses two separate turbo pumps, one for liquid methane and one for liquid oxygen. Each turbo pump feeds propellant into its own preburner, where a small portion of the fuel is ignited using torch igniters to produce hot, high-pressure gas. This gas then drives the turbines connected to the pumps. Torch igniters are used in the preburners. Because of the high temperatures of the preburner exhaust, the main combustion chamber of Raptor 2 has no main igniter, which eliminates the need for Merlin's dedicated consumable igniter fluid. Raptor 2 uses coaxial swirl injectors to admit propellants to the combustion chamber, rather than Merlin's pintle injectors. This is the tricky part Elon was talking about. If the preburner doesn't light, or even doesn't light exactly right, then you've got a challenge. With the Merlin engine, both fuel and oxidizer turbo pumps are mounted on a single shaft, meaning they spin at the same rate and are mechanically synchronized. This simplifies the startup sequence significantly. In the case of Raptor, as I said, you've got an oxygen powerhead and a fuel powerhead, and they're on different shafts. These powerheads are not mechanically linked, but instead crossfeed one another, creating a highly interdependent and delicate startup sequence. Because of this, timing and balance are critical. If either preburner fails to ignite properly or ignites even slightly out of sync, the engine can enter a stoichiometric mix, where fuel and oxidizer are in perfect proportions for maximum combustion. That might sound ideal, but in practice, it can overheat and destroy the preburners, potentially melting or exploding them. That's why starting an engine like this is very complex. Once the engine is running, things become much more manageable. The hot gas produced in the preburners flows into the main combustion chamber, where the remaining methane and oxygen are mixed and fully combusted to generate thrust. However, if anything goes wrong during the start sequence, the result can be catastrophic, either melting or exploding the engine. 
SpaceX has been working with the Raptor engine for some time now. While nine Starship flight tests have been conducted, the complex and delicate start sequence remains a major challenge. The issues arise less on the test stand or at liftoff, but the most persistent problem appears during in-flight relights, as some Raptors still fail to reignite. We have seen this happen even in relatively recent flights, like Flight 7 and Flight 8. There is also concern about the refurbishment process of Raptor 3. In pursuit of a simpler and lighter engine, SpaceX removed traditional components such as bolts and flanges. While these parts are useful in modular engine designs, they add weight, create thermal hotspots, and introduce more potential points of failure due to leaks. To address this, SpaceX has shifted to an almost entirely welded design. This approach improves structural integrity and reduces the number of failure points, but it comes with a significant drawback, a lack of serviceability. Because many parts are welded together into a single unit, the engine cannot be easily disassembled. If a component deep within the engine needs to be replaced, technicians must cut into the structure, which compromises its integrity and demands additional labor and time for reassembly. This process conflicts with one of SpaceX's key goals, rapid reuse. Starship's architecture is built around the idea of flying, landing, and flying again with minimal turnaround time. However, if the engine requires destructive access for repairs, achieving this goal becomes more difficult. To address this challenge, SpaceX may continue to streamline its manufacturing process so that replacement becomes faster and cheaper than repair. This model will support their vision of frequent Starship flights. Alternatively, they could aim to make the engine so reliable that it requires little or no refurbishment at all. However, that is also not easy to accomplish. So, has SpaceX removed too many parts from the Raptor engine? Actually, no. They're looking to remove even more. In a tweet about Raptor 3, Elon Musk wrote, Many improvements are still to come. The ugly, unreliable, and heavy bolted flange between the thrust chamber and hot gas manifold will become a welded joint. If you're wondering what part he's referring to, it's this section of the engine. To most people, it doesn't look particularly ugly, but from an engineering standpoint, it is. Each bolt in that flange has to be precisely installed, potentially involving 10 to 20 steps per nut to ensure it's secure. If even one nut is loose, the whole engine, and potentially the entire rocket, could fail. For a reusable rocket, every bolt becomes a maintenance checkpoint before each flight. That adds time, complexity, and risk. By switching to a welded joint, SpaceX eliminates the need to recheck each bolt. Welds only need a thorough inspection, such as an X-ray after fabrication. If they pass, they may only need to be checked once every 10 flights or even less often. This change also removes the weight of the flange, bolts, and gaskets, which are potential failure points themselves. The weight savings may seem minor, but every gram counts in rocketry. Even a small reduction could let you bring an extra candy bar to Mars, and in my opinion, that's totally worth it. For now, it's unlikely that SpaceX will choose to remove the bolted flanges or significantly alter the Raptor 3 design. The engine is still in the development phase and hasn't reached its final form. The bolts appear to be strategically placed to allow internal inspection using an endoscope. Ultimately, the goal is for the engines to require no refurbishment between flights, allowing same-day reuse. At present, engines are becoming obsolete faster than they're wearing out. We still don't know exactly what the final version of the Raptor engine will look like, but the idea of its successor, Raptor 4, has been mentioned by Elon Musk himself. Rumors suggest it could produce between 330 and 335 tons of thrust. Such a leap would enable Starship to exceed 10,000 tons of thrust at liftoff, a major milestone in humanity's journey toward Mars and beyond. But Raptor 4 may be more than just a performance upgrade. It could represent a fundamental redesign, featuring a cleaner startup sequence, improved serviceability, greater modularity, and tighter integration with future Starship variants. If so, it would build directly on the lessons learned from Raptor 3. From an architectural standpoint, SpaceX's Raptor engine approaching is the physical limits of what's possible with chemical propulsion. It maximizes efficiency through a high-pressure, full-flow, staged combustion cycle, arguably the most advanced form of rocket engine currently feasible. As Elon Musk has often stated, to go beyond this design, you'd likely need to discover new physics. The Raptor architecture is, for now, the pinnacle of what's achievable under known laws of thermodynamics. Maybe if God himself arranged the molecules, you might get another 1% improvement, but that's about it. To truly surpass Raptor and push human spaceflight into deeper frontiers, 
will eventually need to explore entirely different propulsion systems. Nuclear propulsion stands out as the most practical path forward for deep space missions, particularly to the outer solar system, where solar energy is no longer viable. Photovoltaic arrays lose effectiveness at those distances, leaving nuclear power as the only consistent and scalable option. There are several proposed reactor-powered engine concepts, but two stand out, nuclear electric propulsion and nuclear thermal propulsion. Nuclear electric propulsion works by converting heat from a nuclear reactor into electricity. That electricity is used to ionize a noble gas, typically xenon or krypton, and then accelerate the ionized particles out of a thruster using electromagnetic fields. This produces a small but continuous amount of thrust, allowing spacecraft to accelerate over long periods. These ion thrusters are already used on satellites and space probes, usually powered by solar panels. But beyond a certain distance from the sun, solar power becomes impractical, making nuclear-powered NEP the only viable option. Nuclear thermal propulsion, on the other hand, directly harnesses heat from nuclear fission to energize a liquid propellant like hydrogen. The propellant is pumped through a reactor, rapidly heated into a gas, and expelled through a nozzle to generate thrust. NTP systems can deliver about twice the efficiency of traditional chemical rockets, enabling faster travel times and the ability to carry heavier payloads. While both nuclear propulsion technologies offer promising pathways to the outer solar system, they still face significant development and regulatory hurdles before they're ready for crewed missions. Until then, the focus remains firmly on SpaceX's Starship and its Raptor engines, the most advanced chemical rocket engines ever built and the centerpiece of near-term space exploration.